Australia's rich just keep getting richer, with the number of local billionaires going up from 33 to 43 now, and a combined wealth sitting at $160 billion. This was some new research we saw today from Oxfam, the top 1% of Australians owning more wealth than the bottom 70%. Mm. So this got us thinking, is this wildly unsurprising? Will it ever change, or is it something that we ought to pay more attention to and have a talk about? Well, for tonight's Taking Stock, we're joined by Scott Phillips, Chief Investment Officer at The Motley Fool, and Shivani Gopal, CEO of The Remarkable Woman. So, I suppose, Scott, I might start with you. What do you think when you see that Australian billionaires, a number of them have hit 43, does that surprise you? It doesn't. I think this is the this is the amazing thing about we talk regularly about compound interest, about compounding. It's kind of what you'd expect to happen. If you track the rich list growth over the last 10, 20, 30 years, you see that almost unsurprisingly, the top keep getting richer. And the problem with compounding, and Shivani actually tweeted about this with the gender mm. pay gap today, but it's the same with any gap between rich and poor, is if everyone's wealth increased at X percent, the exponential reality of that means if you start with a larger amount, that grows faster in pure dollar terms. So if you're compounding 10 bucks versus a million bucks, well guess what? Mm. The 10 dollars might become 100, but the million becomes 100 million. And so the gap just gets bigger by virtue of that pure compounding that's having effect. And yes, it's going to keep being the case. Mm. Um, the only thing that's going to change that is frankly, redistribution, i.e. tax, and no one wants to talk about that. Or the other option is, and it happens to be the case over many centuries, is war, dislocation, disruption, changes to the value of money. So you kind of want to be careful what you wish for, right? Because at some level, you know, you either have that rich getting richer, poor maybe not getting poorer, but not getting rich at the same rate, or you've got to take some really serious concrete actions, or you hope it doesn't happen, but there's something that disrupts the economy to the extent that it really does redress. And world wars are a classic. France after World War One, potentially, for example, really, really big gap where the, the rich and poor gap came down dramatically because of the change in the value of money, the value of assets, and of course the destruction wrought by war. Hmm. Shivani, what did you take away from it today? Yeah, very similar to Scott, and we, we did have a bit of a Twitter conversation around the, um, the impact of compound interest, but this isn't surprising, right, because this is how wealth works. There's a saying around this, it takes money to make money, and that applies incredibly positively and accelerates the wealthy, but it really detracts from those who are underprivileged. I mean, think about it from, from the perspective of wanting to rise from your station. How do you do that? You go and get educated, and education is the linchpin of breaking away from the classes System, or at least it used to be. But if you want to be full-time educated, it also means you can't work full-time. Who can do that? Only those who were supported by those who have, you know, wealthy families, for example. So for those who start off with nothing, it's incredibly difficult to break the cycle. Again, let's think about it from the other side. Um, if you want to start a business, for example, they, they always say start for funding by going to your friends and your family. And if you come from a wealthy circle, you can very easily change the dynamic and start start that, that cycle creation of actually building capital, building wealth. If you don't come from anything, the barriers to entry are incredibly high. So for that reason, the poverty cycle just continues on and on. So it's not surprising. What is surprising is that we're not doing more and more about it. It's interesting. I, I read an, an article in Market Watch today which said that the number one misconception when it comes to people's wealth is that it is uh, about income as, a, as opposed to wealth, right? Which is what you're both saying, is that if, if there were any kind of taxation on actual net wealth, as opposed to income in the same sort of way, yeah. then perhaps this gap of 1% versus 70%, it wouldn't be the way it is. And, and we've got to, like, these, are, these are the really hard, difficult conversations that frankly no politician's ever going to have. We can have on this channel because we're not up for our election, but things quite frankly like estate taxes, death taxes, let's call them what they are, right? If you've got a lot of inherited wealth, if I leave $100 million to my kids, they leave a billion dollars to their kids, they leave $100 million to their kids, th there is no end to that cycle. Mm -hmm. It's a positive cycle in their case, but for everyone who doesn't have that opportunity of being given a head start by their parents, you can never get that. The, the generational element of that is really significant. And again, marginal tax rates on the nth billion dollars or million dollars of, of income earned or tax, as you say, or sorry, wealth, as you say, that question of how do you tax wealth as opposed to income, when you've already got such a large stock of capital to start with, mm. you're either locking that in and letting it compound because you're not taxing the, the, you're taxing the earnings, not the base, which again might be fine. That's what people talk about land taxes, property taxes, and they can, they are, these are really, really emotive topics. And there's people right now throwing things at the television, calling me names. Um, I'm not saying you should do it necessarily, but if we're serious about how society is structured and how we work out and think about that wealth gap, these are the conversations we need to have because mm. this is going to be, but those, those rules, those policies, those regulations define the next generation of wealth inequality or not. Mm. Yeah. It can be broken down into pretty, um, when you're talking about the disadvantage that um, remains kind of a vicious circle, it kind of the, 
the other end, mm. as opposed to talking like taxing the wealth on that end, you can you can break down some pretty disadvantaged groups. You've got the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander. You guys, I mean, mm -hmm. you've flagged the issue of the women because yes. that still remains a massive um, inequality issue mm -hmm. from a financial perspective in Australia too. And was born out in that report. Yeah, it, it really does, and that's where you can start to see how bigger and bigger it permeates. Mm -hmm. So you know, Oxfam did some study on this, and they found that when it comes to wealth accumulation, men worldwide are 50% wealthier than women. Mm. I mean, that's a staggering number. We talk about the gender pay gap, you know, which differs from country to country, but on average it sits between, say, 14 and 17%. And you take into account bonuses at 21%. Then you look at the wealth gap, and it's 50%. It is absolutely astronomical. Yep. And the cycle continues. So let's take, again, the gender pay gap as an example of that. It's always benchmarked by the lower number. So when employers are asking how much um, they should they should pay a woman, they often ask how much are you currently being paid today? Yes. Your new salary is benchmark on that original anchor. And that's why that poverty cycle continues, the gender pay gap cycle continues. Mm. But if I could add, um, we talked a little while ago, uh, a few weeks ago, about the Gates Foundation. And you know, it wouldn't it be wonderful if more and more industries were doing something like that. If you look at some of the numbers that are coming out of, um, of Ibis World, you'll see that the fast food industry collectively make around 570 billion dollars and yet to, to start making an end to to um to world mm. hunger you'd need about 30 billion dollars you're right so we got that money right here you've got the go. money right yep. there it's just yep. a drop in the ocean for them yep. so i think we what we also need to do in addition to talking about wealth redistribution is starting to talk about philosophy starting to talk about philanthropy and starting to 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 move towards holding ourselves at a higher esteem than what we really should be mm. holding ourselves to rather another big story today guys police busting that one million dollar syndicate uh, selling stolen baby formula on the black market. So this is an investigation which turned up 4,000 tins of baby formula, vitamins, manuka honey, along with $215,000 cash. On the outside, kind of looked like a drug raid, but it was all baby food, which was pretty interesting because yeah. we've all seen those videos of um, you know people stocking up on baby food formula in the shops. These, you know, a lot of this vast majority was stolen, it seems. What did you think of this story today, guys? I'm not, I'm not overly... So, yeah, crime, crime isn't surprising, right? It's, it's been around for as long as we have, so it, it's going to happen. The, the reality is these are high value items and they're super high demand items. And so mm. if you can, frankly, steal something worth 20 bucks Australian retail and sell it into particularly Asia in this case, yep. where the perceived value and the real value is much higher, you're getting a very, very large whack of cash. And this is, you know, anything you can, you can get effectively for free if you steal it, which again isn't legal, but people do, <laughs> but you can sell for a high value and in a foreign jurisdiction, you've kind of got this ready-made market, right? People are used to buying a, a, a grey market, we like to call it. So the, remember the Daigu um, yes. importation of, of a couple of years ago? That's now been largely replaced by traditional channels of the Blackmores and the Bellamy's and the A2 milks going directly to China. But that whole idea of buying from a network of people, you don't know, where, I mean, people didn't know in the past whether it was bought legitimately mm. or stolen. Yeah. Mm. This is using those same supply channels and just stealing the product rather than buying it outright. I mean, it's higher gross margin, right, if you get it for nothing. Yeah, right. so, so look, not, not overly surprised. Uh, and again, the, well, exactly, it's, it's easy, good margin, um, as long as you don't get caught. But the, 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 I'm not surprised it's happening. I think the, the reality is it underscores the really big demand, frankly, from a, on a business level, both in Australia and overseas, mm. for Australian branded Products like yep. vitamins, manuka honey, as you say, and, and infant formula, these are big, big categories. This isn't the legal way to do it, but it really yep. underscores the demand in China for some of these products. Yeah, and you read, even if they can see that same product on the self shelf in China, they prefer that it's come directly from Australia because they don't trust their own authorities to have mm. you know, messed with it or that it's not kind of the pure stuff that they know they can get from Australia. It's, yeah. it's interesting in kind of this situation, it's being treated like drugs in some way, you know, steal the drugs, sell it overseas, it's incredible. Yeah. It, it really is crazy and, and certainly I, I've been um, watching the news over the last couple of years thinking what in the world is going on, but when you look at the context, it does make a lot of sense. I mean, you know, just a couple of years ago, China abolished its uh, its one child policy, so you've had, you know, the, the birth rates double and there are so many women, more and more women rather, who are taking up work, which of course is driving that demand for baby formula. And and what I think is really interesting is, um, is that distrust, as you were saying, um, around Chinese products is still hasn't absolved. So about over a decade ago, there was um, there was some issues around Chinese-made baby formula, um, and unfortunately, there were some infant deaths that that happened, you know, um, alongside that. So th there isn't that trust mm. now with the local product. So I think this is going to be a supply and demand issue, and companies like Me Johnson, who are really profiting from this, really need to think about, um, you know, what they're going to do around their distribution strategy, so that 
you know, all babies can be looked after both in China but also here in Australia because, you know, I've got some friends who um, who've t actually taken the photographs who of all the all the parents running into the grocery store trying to get the um, the baby formula and being left with nothing. Yeah, they're more well, organised than me. Brutal, I'm the one that walks in right at the end, there's nothing left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've been in that situation. I've got to put yeah. the business angle on this yeah. too. I mean, this is, you think about the Australian, this is brand Australia being sold into China, yeah. in this case illegally. Yeah. But I, I really do think the long-term potential for some of these companies, think about Treasury Wine Estates in wine, Blackmore's, A2, Bellamy's, um, you know, uh, Costa, Freedom Foods, there's some great Australian brands, Australian companies, mm. selling brand Australia into Asia and China in particular. Yeah. I think they're really, really strong long-term, multi-decade, frankly, uh, tailwind that, that investors are, can really look out for. Yeah, I've, I've interviewed companies that actually make it a point to have seminars and, and get-togethers with Daigus and, and make sure that they know about their product and make sure that they're on selling them mm. because it is such a huge channel for sales. Yep. Absolutely. All right, did everyone know it's Blue Monday today? Do you know what that is? <laughs> it is the most miserable day of the year. <laughs> this is according to a Welsh mathematician who's actually worked out the third Monday in January is the most grim of them all. Did you feel it today, Chris and I yeah. were saying earlier? We definitely did. And that's our explanation for the tennis star <laughs> Alexander Zverev, who certainly was having a bad day today. Blue Monday. 6141. Yeah, that's Blue Monday right there. Did you feel Blue a bit Monday. like Alexander Zverev today? <laughs> yeah. So what do you, what's the deal? Why do you reckon the third January, uh, third Monday in January is? So called. Blue can, can I be our, can I be our uh, local skeptic on this one? Yeah, I, the, the, there's a formula that's been provided by this guy. W equals d minus d times t to the power of q mm -hmm. over m times na, which apparently is supposed to mean something. Uh, there is each of those letters is supposed to mean something in particular. Uh, although to be fair, the other one he puts in there is the weather. Now, oh, yes. it's from Wales. Right, very true. different weather. So maybe maybe we should be six months apart. Maybe we should be kind of this should be. Oh, so it's a you know, influence. If well, you're that's in what I'm thinking. Nation, that's maybe. what I'm thinking. So no, I thought it was completely on the money. I, well, I felt that today. I thought of all the jobs suddenly this year that were on my list that I should have done last <laughs> year. It was the health insurance. It was uh, something about calling up one of the schools. It was it just came flooding to my brain yeah. today. And, and I thought, then you realised we were going to be on with you tonight, Brooke, it's, and you <laughs> <listening> <laughs> it's, like, it's like the final. Yeah. We're actually back at work now for the whole year. That's we've had it. that summer break and we've got all those stuff we need to do. Yeah. Yeah, look, nothing like a psychic prediction or, or something that has a mathematical calculation <laughs> that just said that explains every problem in my life. I get it now. It wasn't me. It was it was Black it was, Monday. It was the so world. Blue Monday rather. So um, so look, it's it's happening. But you and I compared notes, and we were actually feeling a little bit, you know, yeah. worse for wear today. Yeah. And so I had a look at the formula too and what it was based on. So it is it is weather, but it's also the fact that it's just after New Year's. Everyone's high from the New Year, um, happy from you know all the goals that they've set, and about this time of year, you've probably messed up on one or two of them. Yes. So you've probably missed one or two of those workouts, haven't had that, you know, that poached chicken and green salad for, <laughs> for dinner and, you know, I know I've got a pizza waiting for me at home as well. So, look, those things happen. Here's my little productivity tip. I know I'm, I'm full of those. Notice I said full of those and not full of, you know, it, yes. full of it. Um, is, uh, <laughs> is, um, is to have an if-then strategy whenever you do your New Year's resolutions or your New Year's goals because we're full of positivity whenever we write down what it is that we want to achieve. What you need to also accept is that, surprise, surprise, you're human. So there's going to be times that you're going to screw up and, you you just need to say, if I have a bad day, then I'm going to do this. So I write this for myself. If I feel like procrastinating, then I'm going to do the easiest thing on my job list and then move to the next hardest. So I've already told myself what I'm going to do and I put it as a sticky note on my computer. The next thing that I have is action cue is fear. So my fear is sort of a metaphor for procrastination. Oh, I don't want to do that. Or, yep. oh, whoops, I missed that. Whatever it is. And all I say to myself is just take one action. So just pre-plan, mm -hmm. know you human. There's going to be plenty more blue days, unfortunately, but you can get through it. <laughs> Scott, any productivity yes. tips? What do you do when, when you're trying to... I, I always do. I, I heard if then I thought, if I have a bad day, I was speaking yep. to try and say, I open a bottle of red wine, which kind of my solution. <laughs> but I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure it necessarily fits hey, in the I same... I like that one. <laughs> it works for me, but it may not be, it may not be everyone's cup of tea for getting back on the, on the horse. Uh, look, you know, I, I'm a fan of... I'm, there's, a, there's a great... Um, it's about what you do next, not what you've just done. Mm -hmm. So the ability to put something behind you and say, okay, that, that was then, right? It's the only thing about trying to lose weight, trying to go on a diet. Trying, every Monday is the Monday you're gonna start, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a great one saying, yeah. on Monday I'm gonna do it. Then Monday I mess up like, next Monday is the one, right? And so you start to get in this cycle of like, you know, what, you miss the first one, and you kind of feel like the day's gone, the week's gone, yeah. or whatever. Just trying to, somehow it's hard to do, put the past in the past, look forward to say, right, the next thing I do is what's important, not the last thing. I, uh I agree, and I think that we're also missing the glass half full of all this, which is 
Blue Monday is pretty much over, everybody. It's over. You made it. Oh, yeah, yeah, There's not going to be a worse Monday than you've just been through. So well done. <laughs> we should glass half all the off a glass of wine with the metaphor. I was, I was, I was going with that. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. At least Scott was right, and it's actually in show. six months, and then it's still happening. You're going to do it all over again. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Oh, exactly right. Scott Phillips, thank you very much. Shivani Gopal, thank you. Thank for being you. With us, as thank always. You.